several years back, uh, there was a cute animated movie that came out called Over the Hedge. Some of you may remember that. It's actually a few more years. I had to add it up and actually go look. It's back from 2006. Kelsey was just a, a little one back then. Uh, the movie's about these, these animals out in the forest that wake from their, their hibernating slumber. And they wake and they start to look around and they realize they need to gather food again for the, the next year. They start early. And as they start wandering around the forest, they realize there's a hedge that suddenly appeared that wasn't there when they started hibernating. They explore the hedge going different directions. It's a tall hedge. Uh, they can't find the end of it, so they realize and determine that it's best for us to stay on this side of the hedge. We'll, we'll go ahead and live our lives and do what we've always done. But then a raccoon comes along who has seen a thing or two in life, and he introduces them to things on the other side of the hedge, which was a subdivision that came in while they slept. And on that, in that subdivision is people food. And he introduces these, these wilderness animals to people food. And, and at first, they're rummaging through the garbage. But then he tells them where the good stuff really is on the inside of the homes. And he introduces them to, I, I, I think I can say, we'll, we'll just say, um, what, what are those things? Um, I'm trying. I guess I can say Doritos, right? <laughs> he introduces them to Doritos, and when he opens up the bag, th this this yellow golden powder comes out and showers them, and they're like, "What is this? This thing that we've never had?" Movie goes on as with their hijinks, as every every cartoon does, and uh, it's a cute little cute little movie. Do you realize that that you and I have a hedge around us? We, we do. God has placed a hedge around each one of us. This hedge is for our protection, for our support and encouragement that is separated from anything that we can do. Our Heavenly Father is that perfect Father that continually, 24-7, watches over us and provides us assistance and care beyond what we even know that we need. Each of us go forward living a physical life, often working hard to choose a path that would glorify God that would bring praise to him and the path that he wants us to follow. And as we wake each morning, and as we lay our head down on the pillow each night, our wonderful Father watches over our daily movements, providing his assistance and care. Sometimes I have to pause and ask myself, why me? Why would God in his love and mercy call me to his way of truth and to his way of life? He not only opened my eyes to understand his word, but then he brought my heart along to want to follow him. Uh, to me, I sometimes pause and I, I question because I'm just Mike. I'm just a human being. I, I have my challenges and things I continue to fight against. Why would God call me? And sometimes I ask the same question. Why me when trial hits, when challenges come up, when we battle through uh, things that don't seem right? that don't seem fair. Sometimes I can look across my neighbor's yard and see what they're doing and the life they're living, and it seems unfair that sometimes I'm not living their life for the things that they're going through. And you know, that's just my view of things. It's not the truth of really what they're going for. I'd never want to exchange what God has brought me to, but we often ask those questions. Why me on our calling? And sometimes we ask why me when we go through challenges. But the truth be told, both the good and in those difficult moments, that the hedge that God puts around us is solid. It's, it's unbreakable. And it's that encouragement that we constantly need as we go through life. So today I'd like to take some time to consider how each of us is hedged in by God as we live and we go through our lives. From time to time, the Christian will battle trial and, and challenges, and you're probably sitting there saying, yeah, tell me about it. We go through life, and it's not easy. I know for me personally, when, when trial comes on or challenge comes on, I have to go to God's Word. It's the only place I can go, and I recount different stories. I try to think of new examples that we have of God's people battling through trial and adversity. And often, I think of King David. And I think of the Psalms that we have recorded by his hand and by some others that we have recorded for us today. Because in the Psalms, we have uh, examples of so many times where, where King David and others talk about this hedge, talk about this hand, this protection 
that God puts around them in the midst of their battles and challenges. I'd like to start off today by looking at several of these psalms, and we're going to kind of go through these in, in kind of a straight order, um, because I want to lay a foundation. Let's turn first to Psalms five, Psalm 5, verse 11, because I want to lay a foundation of what we have recorded in the psalms, and also that God is always with us through whatever we battle through. Because often when we're going through trial, we'll find one psalm that really encourages us or we'll go one direction. But I want to kind of lay a foundation because there are so many examples that we have recorded for us of God's hand being that support, being that hedge around us. And, and so just, just hang in with me as we work through several of these early in this message. Psalm 5. First one, Psalm 5 and verse 11. Here we have recorded, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who also let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. And we know that's God's divine intervention that goes before us. We can't do anything about. We can't set up and we can't change what's going to happen. It's God's favor that goes before us so often in life. It says, with favor, you will surround him as with a shield. God's favor is that protection around us that we so often need. And as in this example, as a soldier or someone doing battle would need. The next one, let's turn to Psalm 145 and verse 8. Psalm 145. In verse 8, here another psalm of David. It says a praise of David in, in my Bible. It says, Psalm 145, verse 8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. Verse 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. Verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord uh, preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's turn back to Psalm 31, verse 14. Psalm 31 and verse 14. Another Psalm of David. He says in verse 14, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speaks insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. O oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. Let's turn ahead to uh, Psalm 34, verse 4. Just a couple chapters. Psalm 34, in verse 4. Another Psalm of David. 34, verse 4. David says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked at him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. 
the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. That, that encampment, like that hedge that God puts around his people, says the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lion lacks and suffers hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Verse 15, their eyes, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Verse 17, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Isn't that an understatement? <laughs> Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Let's flip forward to Psalm 91 and verse 1. Again, the, the, I want to lay a foundation because this is not just one or two verses that we read through the Psalms or that we see throughout God's Word. We see it time and time again. And we need to build a, 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 a bookmark, in a sense, for all these places where we have God's Word of encouragement because we have to be able to draw on these things at different times in life. Psalm 91 and verse 1. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. He is that wall, that barrier that protects me. He's a barrier that is solid and I can depend upon. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. Verse 4, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrows that fly by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. And this is in quotes now. Notice so the change of, of how it's being phrased. It says in quote, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's turn forward to Psalm 121 and verse 1. Psalm 121 and verse 1. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Verse 5. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in, that waking moment, that sleeping moment from this time forth and evermore. Flip ahead to Psalm 125, verse 1, a couple of Psalms ahead, 125, verse 1. We'll just read verses 1 and 2 here. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, like that hedge again, that surrounding, that support, that, that protection, that encouragement. So the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. And the final one we'll look at here at the beginning is Psalm 139, verse 1. Psalm 139 and verse 1. Again, a psalm of David. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. Again, my coming and my going, he's saying. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. 
For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Right? God knows us so intimately. He knows our thoughts. He knows our actions. He knows everything about us. That's how intimately God knows us, David is saying. And verse four, 5, you have hedged me behind and before. That protection behind our back when we can't see and defend ourselves and understand what's going on and in front of us. He says that you have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Our great, wonderful, everlasting Father is constantly hedging us about. We go through life. We wake up in the morning. We, we lay our head on the pillow at night. We're constantly under his care. Not a moment goes by that he's un unaware of. Not a situation presents itself that he doesn't see. He's not away on vacation for the two weeks at a time. He doesn't slumber or sleep where he's bothered by us waking him or things like that. He's always aware, always around, always knowing. And he doesn't miss anything that you and I that we go through. And as we just read, he hedges us before and he hedges us from behind as we go through our lives. There's a wonderful example of this hedging that we read in Exodus chapter 13. Let's turn there next, Exodus chapter 13. As you turn, we're breaking into the story here. In this account that we have here, the Israelites have been enslaved in Egypt for a long time. They had forgotten God's ways and his understanding. They have been taken captive and they've, been cap and they've lived in this way of life for a long time. Egypt became home for them. The good things of Egypt, they enjoyed. The bad things of Egypt were familiar. They continued to live their lives until God drew them out and brought them out. And as they went out with a high hand that God blessed them with, they went out into the wilderness. They went out into things that they weren't comfortable anymore with. And we pick up the story as they leave and as Pharaoh's armies are not happy, and Pharaoh himself is not happy that they're leaving, and we pick up the story in Exodus 13 and verse 21. Because they were not alone as they went out. They were never by themselves. God was constantly and always with them. Exodus 13, verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. For next chapter, 14 and verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Phihiroth between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon, and you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. They're confused. These mountains, they don't even know where they're going, these crazy people. The wilderness has closed them in. And then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over his, all of his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told to the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him, and he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt, with captains over every one of them. It's a huge amassed army, and the Israelites would easily be overran by horse, horsemen and chariots. And so he brings all this together, and it says, And the Lord hardened the heart, verse 8, eight the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea, besides Phihiroth, Phi before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. 
And they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? So many times I read through this passage and I think as I've become older, I realize and I try to put myself in the Egyptians or in the Israelite shoes. What would I have done? What would I have done had God brought me out of this strange place, this place that was comfortable? I mean, it was Egypt. It was all they knew for everything that it had, the goodness, for the evil that it had. They were comfortable with it. They, they recognized it. Often I think of our society today. We, we live in a place where we see the evil around us. This is where we've been born, where we've been raised. And I often think about, because we, we often go and, and look at this phrase and say, well, did they not see the plagues? Did they not see God's mighty hand? Do they not remember? That wasn't that long ago, these, these silly Israelites. But when that's all you know, that's your home, it's hard to then realize that you're now let out into the wilderness, let out into what looks like tragedy. And this is where the Israelites are and their response in a lot of ways would be understanding. And, and that's where I try to put myself in their shoes and consider it from their point of view. What would I have done? He says, and they go on to say in the middle of verse 12, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that, than that we should die in this wilderness or in the wilderness. But then Moses says to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And then we have this amazing example of this hedge being put around the Israelites in verse 19. It says, and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel, this hedge, this protection, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. What an amazing account that we have here of God going before his people. In fact, he went behind his people to protect them, to be that shield. God did not lead his people out of Egypt and take them right to a Marriott beachfront resort, did he? That would have been nice. A beachfront resort with a, some, some nice little drinks with a little umbrella in it, palm trees, coconuts, bananas, just chilling out. That would have been wonderful in Mike Phelps's sense of mind or in my view he didn't do that he what did he do he led them through a wilderness takes them out of their comfort zone for all that it was good and all that it was bad and then leads them to the wilderness and it wasn't easy moving and i know they faced levels of challenges but god places a hedge around israel he provides them protection and safety with this hedge the hedge offered encouragement when strength was low God had so many ways that he could have intervened for Israel. So many ways. They could have been in Egypt. The Pharaoh could have got on the chariots with all the men. They could have whipped the horses and all the wheels just fall off the chariots. That would have been an amazing way, all at the same time, where they would have had to say, that doesn't happen every day. He could have taken them along the road as they're trying to catch up to the Israelites. And he could have brought hail from the heavens. And he could have brought lightning from the heavens and devoured them. He could have opened up the earth with an earthquake, allowed boulders to fall from mountains and just interrupt their travel to block their path. He had so many ways he could have intervened. But how did he intervene for Israel? He goes behind, he provides that protection. He says, I've got your back. You're not alone. I didn't mess this up. I'm here in the wilderness with you. This place of trial, this place of challenge, this is unknown area, I'm here with you. It's an amazing account. He stood in the gap between the Israelites and Pharaoh. He was, in a sense, a mother hen to her chicks, that mama grizzly bear to her cubs. Nothing was going to get to God's people. God made himself a hedge to protect the Israelites but you may be thinking, if I have a hedge around me, 
then why do I battle through challenge? Why do I have trials still in my life? It's a question that I'm, every one of us here, have, we've asked ourselves from time to time. While each of us do have a hedge placed around us by God, we are not fully immune to the challenges that many face in the world. We deal with illness. We deal with job problems. We deal with friendships and family issues. We're taken advantage at times. We're even sometimes persecuted when we follow God and we do things his way in life. Jesus said that this would be part of our walk in life. Let's turn to Matthew 5 and verse 10. Early on in, the, in, in his sermon on the mount, Jesus Christ starts off with saying all the blessed blessings, uh, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, and he goes through all these different attitudes that you and I can have and the blessings that we receive for them and the, and the way and the character that we develop. Towards the end here, Matthew 5 and verse 10, he, he does another one. This one's kind of hard to read at times. Matthew 5 and verse 10, Christ says, blessed are, those, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for in my name's sake. We're told that we will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. That doesn't add up. But we're told that this is the lot we have for our lives Many of the apostles also wrote about challenges and trials that the Christian would face. Let's turn to 1 Peter 1 and verse, verse 1, or chapter 1, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and I will be, start reading in verse 3. A little background on the letter that Peter is writing. When the Apostle Peter wrote this letter that the Christians were facing great persecution at the hand of Nero, so around 64 AD. He wrote this letter to offer encouragement, to offer support and remind them of the hope of eternal life and to encourage them to continue living holy lives, even in the face of persecution. Right at the beginning of this, this letter, 1 Peter 1, verse 3, he starts off by reminding them of who we are before God and what God gave so that we could have eternal life and a relationship with him. He goes to start 1 Peter 1, verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. That, that, that word kept, I think in our English language, we've lost a lot of meaning in the word kept. Because I'll say, I, I keep my wallet in my pocket, and, and you all know what I mean. Or I keep my car in the garage. It's, it's parked there. It's where I put things. But in, in the Greek, this word had a lot more meaning, this word kept. It's a verb that meant to watch in advance, kind of like a soldier who would look out and be careful when he's keeping guard, making sure that everybody who's his responsibility and is being protected. It can also mean to hem, hem in or to protect, to keep. That's the, this word is, is much deeper in, in the Greek. So again, it says, who are kept, and so you got to think of this figurative way that the word is being used, by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. He goes on to say, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That's kind of an understatement when you're being persecuted by Nero, that you have been grieved by various trials. <laughs> yeah. That the, but why? That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, in whom he not seen you love. That faith that we heard about in the sermonette described is, is what's being in that the genuine enough, genuineness of your faith would what? Bring praise honor and glory to God. That when we face trials and challenges, and yet we go back to the Psalms, we go back to God's word, those accounts that we have, 
and we, and we re remember that hedge that God always puts around us, that we're never alone, that we have his support. And so our faith can be built and our faith can be demonstrated that we would praise, honor, and glory God in what we go through. Later in, in the same letter in, in chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter comes back to this thought. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Peter again says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, remember the, the background to this letter, the Christians are being persecuted by the hand of Nero. So he's saying, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he was blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So he's saying, you're going to, in the face of persecution, continue to do what you know you're supposed to do. Continue to praise God. Continue to look to him. For us today... We are constantly attacked by Satan. We live in a society that has been under his sway for, it seems like, forever, right? The ways of this world are not the ways of our God and of you and me. Many of the places we go, many of the conversations that we are part of, you and I, we're the odd ones out. So we may read this and understand that they were being persecuted by an emperor. You and I are persecuted by our adversary. And we're constantly being attacked, constantly being trying to knock down and, and shifted from the foundation that we're on. So again, Peter's saying in verse 14, if you're reproached for the name of Christ, if you are taking a stand for what is right in life, you're defending those who need to be defended. You're standing for those who, who need your support. He's saying, if you're doing these things, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified, but let none of you suffer as a murderer. He says, don't go along with the stream. Don't resort to dropping down to their level in life. He says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. In verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God, commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. The Apostle Peter wasn't the only one that talked about trial and, and challenges. The Apostle James also spoke on a similar theme in James 1, verse 2. Uh, one, one book before Peter, James, and we'll start at the beginning of this book as well, or this letter as well, James 1 and verse 2. Remember, James is the half-brother of Jesus. He lived life. He saw the example. He also has seen challenges. After Christ's ascension to heaven, he saw the persecution begin, and he saw the challenges that the Christianity would face. James 1 and verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when, notice he doesn't say if, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That's a hard statement to read, isn't it? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. When Paul's here and share the same verse or same passage um, from another translation, the English Standard Version says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. This word for temptation or trial from the Greek lexicon, the Thayer's Greek lexicon, can mean adversity, affliction, trouble, serving to test, prove, and, and, and test and prove someone's character, someone's faith. Again, from the New King James, it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation or trial, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. God does not keep us from all pain and trial. 
We cannot know the depth or strength of our character until it's tested by these types of things coming up on us. In a way, it's at times when we battle trial, it's like removing the training wheels off of a kid's bike. We could leave the wheels on there forever. Even as they grow, we can get bigger training wheels, right? We can get a bigger bike, bigger training wheels. We never have to remove them. But if we don't, the child never learns how to ride a bike. God knows at some point it's time for us to grow and learn how to live this thing called life. And learning how to ride a bike is just one part of a person's life. Someday they'll learn how to swim. Our kids learn how to swim. Someday they'll learn how to drive a car. There's so many aspects of life that our kids learn how to do. There's so many aspects of living life that God wants us to learn how to do as well. Therefore, we have various trials and challenges that come in life so we can learn new things about ourselves and learn to develop new qualities to endure various trials that we go through. While trials are often incredibly difficult to go through, we can rest assured that God is always there with us, that constant hedge, that support, that encouragement that we always need, that he's always there. Going back to the bike analogy for a moment, when we took those training wheels off our kids' bikes, the next moment, we didn't take them up to the biggest hill we could find, did we? Put them on that bike, give them a shove, and say, here you go, learn how to ride your bike. That wouldn't be what a loving father would do, would it? Or a mother. We just saw, we, we did this with Kels. We just saw, Laura and I were walking through our neighborhood the other day. We saw a kid learning how to ride his bike. His dad was running alongside of him, kind of with a handout. I've seen some that will put their hand on the seat to help steady it. They don't take them to the highest hill and just give them a shove over the edge and say, you're going to learn it. Our Heavenly Father doesn't do that with life for us either. He doesn't just take the training wheels off life and then say, here you go off the biggest hill and he's way up on the top and we're <laughs> in a mess on our way down. But he's with us. He's constantly providing that support, that encouragement. We have to know and trust and feel that he's there. That's why it's so important that I wanted to lay that foundation with the Psalms because that's where we go when we need help. That's where we go when we need support and encouragement. We go to the other accounts that we have in God's word of people who dealt with trial and dealt with adversity, and we read the times that God intervenes, and he helps. God will most likely not just remove the trial from our lives from the very beginning, but he runs alongside He's that hedge that protects us from ever falling too deep into grief. And often in times, we do find a path to walk that leads to a peaceful rest with God where we realize that everything in life is going to be okay. Again, from verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation or trial, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised those who love him. God's crown of life is not glory and honor here on earth, but a reward of eternal life, that perfect unison and existence with God forever and ever. We read through what the Apostle Peter said, the Apostle James. The Apostle Paul was another that referenced the struggle we face in this physical existence as we battle challenge. Let's turn to Romans 5 and verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. The Apostle Paul here in Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith to, into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. It's another one of those hard passages at time to read. But we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Some translations uh, change that to endurance. That tribulation produces perseverance or endurance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Who is given, which was given to us. 
that we glory in tribulation. That's a hard one because when you're, when you're battling through the trial and you're in the midst of it and you don't know how it's all going to work out, it's, it's I, I can, I don't, <laughs> standing before you, I don't, I don't know if I can say I've gloried in those moments because it's hard. You don't know where God's going to provide an exit. You haven't seen his hand necessarily provide, but Paul is saying that's the mindset we have to have. Why? Because of the character that's being developed. You look at the character that he's saying is being developed here, perseverance or endurance. We know how that gets developed in our lives, right? It's through trial. I would encourage you to be careful and cautious if you ever pray that God gives you more perseverance or endurance. Because we often know where that comes from, don't we? It comes from a, a place where we find ourselves stuck, it feels like, and we have to battle through. What about the next one, character? Pray for character. We know where that comes from, too. That comes from living life and battling through trials and challenges. And Paul's saying, you can glory in tribulation knowing that these characteristics that you would not agree to sign up for on your own, even if God came and said, would you like to be have more character? Oh, yeah, I'd love to have more character. This is the trial. Hang on a second. Let me, <laughs> let me, let me rethink this one. You want endurance? Oh, I'd love to have endurance. Well, this is how it's coming. I'm not sure I'm ready for that one, God. And he's, Paul is saying, let's glory in that because we know these characters that we would, characteristics that we wouldn't normally agree to let God just sign up for and, and put in our life will come. Paul is saying that we can glory in these things because of what they produce. Chapter 12, continuing in Romans, chapter 12 is a section that speaks to the characteristics that the Christian can develop. Remember, this is still Paul's letter. Romans 12 and verse 9. As we battle through tribulation, the character is developed. And he, Paul says that battling through tri tribulation is part of the characteristics of a true Christian. Verse 9, Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. All these things sound great. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. All that character that Paul is saying can be developed. One of them is patient and tribulation. Even as we know these scriptures and know that we're not immunized to trial and suffering, it's not pleasurable to be in difficult situations. In the midst of these challenging situations, we often ask the whys. We battle with doubts. We wonder about the purpose. Paul again addresses this in probably one of his last letters ever written when he wrote to Timothy. This is 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, or verse 10. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. Paul may have wrote other letters or, or things. We're not exactly sure, but this would definitely be towards the end of his life, this le second letter that he wrote to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. Again, the Apostle Paul says, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, he's writing to Timothy and saying, you've carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, all these things that he's saying, you followed me almost in lockstep. You've carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, you followed my long suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. <laughs> it's one of those, yay me. All who, live, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men, impostors will go worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. He's talking to Timothy. God is talking to you and me. We know his word. We know the trials that we've been through. We know the character that God wants us to have. We know the approach. Paul's telling Timothy, but in turn, we're being told the same thing. Again, verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Each of us, we've read through and we've heard uh, shared from different sermons the things that Paul went through, the tribulations, the trials. He puts in his own words the things that he had went through to preach and share the gospel of the kingdom. Did God put a hedge around Paul? He absolutely did. We can read accounts of Paul escaping death, of Paul receiving protection. Most importantly, of Paul receiving the encouragement and the strength to carry on with life. This is that hedge that God puts around, put around Paul, but he also puts around each one of us. That support, that encouragement as we battle through tribulation, as we battle through trial, we battle through weakness, moments of weakness. Later in the same letter to Timothy, this time in chapter 4, Paul addresses this in more detail. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 16. Paul says, at my first defense, no one stood with me. Most likely he was tried. He was before some sort of judge. And where was his support? Where was those who walked with him? Where were those who could account for what he was saying as being a teaching of Jesus and, other, and, and being of God? He's saying, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. What a testimony of faith that we have and confidence in this hedge that Paul always knew was around him that even through those moments that we could read through of shipwreck, of peril upon peril, he said, God was with me. He was that hedge that supported me. But you also have to remember that Paul, or that Paul shared these thoughts that we have in Timothy while he was in prison. And we're not talking the house arrest where he was chained to another guard and those were able to come to him and he was able to teach. Most likely when he wrote this letter, he was in a cold, dark, dingy dungeon awaiting his death. In this challenging situation that I personally can't begin to try to wrap my mind around, here's Paul, the Apostle Paul, saying, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me at these different moments in life. And if he was to say this to Timothy, he knew he was still under that same hedge, around, protected by that same hedge. He was still under the care of God. It's an amazing account that we have here in Timothy when if you ever have an opportunity to read through it with the mindset of him being in this cold, dark dungeon, it changes the, what comes out to you through this passage. Let's read verse 17 and 18 again with this concept and this knowledge in mind. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. As we begin nearing the end of the message, I'd be amiss if I didn't include one passage that Paul shared with us to offer us further encouragement. You can put in your notes Romans 8, verse 28. Where Paul says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good to those who love God. I'm not Paul. I try to put myself in his shoes. I, I don't know if he could have this mindset that he encourages us to have when he's in the midst of trial always. When you're in the throes of a challenging situation and somebody says, all things work together for good to those who love, I'm sure Paul was saying, I can't handle this right now. 
Paul was human just like you and me. We all have to battle through our thoughts and feelings to work to keep this mindset. And it's a challenge at times. That all things work together for good. But this is a promise from God. And it's for those who believe on him and his son. In the mind of a Christian, we work to have a new perspective on the challenges we face. We work to maintain a different mindset. We work to keep established a hope not on the physical things that surround us, but a hope established on all that God offers us today and will offer us in the future. Because of this, our faith doesn't waver in trial and difficulty because we know God is always with us. Again, we laid a foundation of looking at those psalms as we started out today. Time and time and time again, David spoke of this hand, the support, the encouragement, the hedge. God went before. God went, goes behind. His hedge is always about us as well. Again, let's consider, we already looked there so you can just listen along. Let's consider an excerpt from Psalm 139 that we read earlier. David says, Psalm 139, verse 2, You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted in all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you knew it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before. You laid your hand upon me. Even there, your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. As we conclude, let's turn to Psalm, one last Psalm, Psalm 23. Challenge comes to each of us. Persecution, at times, comes our way as well. In the midst of these trying moments, sometimes all we can do is cry out to God for his help, for his hand, for his encouragement. When we get moments of peace within those trials and challenges, we can come to the Psalms. We can read what God has done for David in, in his times. Think about all the things that he'd went through, yet he could reflect and say these things, these promises, and, and he remembers those times. We see the apostles who, who endured countless trials, tribulation, doing God's work they battled through. In the midst of these moments that you and I all face, we can go to God's word and we can have the encouragement that we need from these things. It's a mindset shift, though. We have to desire to go to these moments, to know that this is our life raft. It's like getting thrown overboard on a ship and there's this life raft there, but we decide to swim away from it. That doesn't make sense, does it? His word is that life raft. You swim towards it. And that's why in these moments that if you're not battling something right now, put some of these scriptures to memory. Write down and maybe study them through the week so that when things happen, you can see your life raft that is right here. Psalm 23, as we close, is one of those extreme life rafts that we all have to remember. Psalm 23 and verse 1, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.